on behalf of the Public Art Network and Americans for the Arts, let's begin. Uh, I'll hand the reins over to Patricia Walsh to start us off for our discussion of 20 years of public art. Wonderful, thank you so much, Christina. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, welcome everyone to our event today on the 20th anniversary for the Public Art Network and Year in Review. For those who don't know me, I'm Patricia Walsh and the Public Art Programs Manager and Civic Design Program Manager here at Americans for the Arts. I will be your moderator for the evening. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the land I'm presenting from and its relationship to the Native peoples, past and present and future. If you'd like to join me in a brief acknowledgement, here's a template, template pasted in the chat box you can use. With that, I am presenting today from Dutchess County, New York, where I live on land stolen from, Mohe from the Mohican and Muncie Lenape peoples by Europeans. Today's program will include uh, an overview of two parts. The first is an overview of the work America's Europe has done for the past 20 years to support the public art field. And the second is a panel discussion to dive into the role public art has been and continues to play in communities across the country. To start us off, I introduce Bob Lynch, President and CEO of Americans for the Arts. Bob. Thank you so much and welcome to everybody for the uh, 20th anniversary celebration for the Public Art Network and for the year in review. Um, 20 years, uh, I can't believe it, that has gone by so fast um, and uh, so much has uh, happened. Um, we've uh, tra traveled together on a wonderful journey. Uh, I'm actually uh, speaking to you up from uh, Cape Cod, Mashpee uh, on Cape Cod, which is the land of the Wampanoag Indians, the Wampanoag and the Nasset, who are still here. They're my neighbors here as the, uh, Mas uh, the Mashpee Indian tribe that is a federally re recognized tribe that's, that's, uh, that's here and thriving and has been here since the early 1800s in this town, um, in this area. And actually just uh, an observation, one of the great public art things that uh, a number of the the tribal members do is little small pieces of art that are put in surprise places like telephone poles and trees as you drive through the town. It's, it's really wonderful. Um, what started out in concept as a simple celebration um, has transformed into today's presentation uh, to both acknowledge the ongoing work um, that our organization, Americans for the Arts, um, has, has done as a national friend and an advocate and a fan uh, in the public art field, um, and also to support ongoing dialogue about the role of public art in community, um, to talk about how past and current issues intersect with this field. Um, I didn't know that that's what the field was gonna be about some half a century ago when I looked out my high school window in Boston and saw uh, Sister Carita and paint and the Boston gas giant gas uh, tank um, create a magnificent piece of art that also was controversial um, as possibly a critique of the Vietnam War. So that idea of current issues intersecting with the field was there right at the very beginning. 20 years ago, a small and growing group of administrators in municipal public art programs came together to launch the Public Art Network and grown to more than 1300 members to date the Public Art Network is the only professional network in the United States dedicated to advancing public uh, art programs and projects through advocacy, through policy, and through information resources to further art and design in uh, our built environment. And I'd add to that um, celebration like we're doing tonight to celebrate the great work and the, and the great achievement. And I wanna just make an acknowledgement to um, one of my former board members, um, uh, member Jerry Allen, when he was on the board, was a great proponent and a great advocate for us to get more involved and involved as we are today in this work. So thanks, Jerry. Um, out of that original group grew one of the signature programs that aimed to recognize excellence in the field, the Year in Review. The Year in Review program grew from an on-site event as a showcase for the various works that members were doing around the country to uh, a jury program that has since highlighted over 800 artworks that showed excellence in the field. Uh, from 2000 to, two th to uh, 2019, Year in Review annually recognized outstanding public art projects that represent the most compelling work 
for the year from across the country and beyond. Um, and uh, we are not just observers, but uh, but users of the backdrop for our, our website and many of the and all the pages of the website come from work uh, out of uh, out of the public art area on year in review. And I use it as a as a place to go when I'm looking for some soothing uh, moments of contemplation uh, in a, a day that doesn't offer that very often. So we'll keep it uh, handy to make sure we I see uh, what uh, what what you have done over the years. The network and its corresponding public art network advisory council, uh, and thank you to the hard work that the council does, uh, have become a bedrock for resource um, and knowledge uh, and knowledge sharing to support um, established and new public art programs alike. Patricia is going to go into a lot more depth uh, in the work that has happened since then, uh, but I want to take a moment to talk about. Uh, a more recent expansion of our work in the public art field uh, with the support of the George M. Perez Family Foundation, uh, which gave a $250,000 gift to support a five-year program designed to highlight individuals doing amazing work with public art in communities all across our country. George and Darlene Perez Prize in Public Art and Civic Design Program celebrates and highlights the work of individuals who support, develop, and manage the incorporation of art into the design of places and spaces across the United States. People like many of you right here. Uh, this year, we welcome the inaugural awardee of the prize um, to artist Vinnie Bagwell, uh, who we will be hearing from a little bit later um, as a part of the panel. But I want to say welcome and congratulations to Vinny um, before that. And I want to thank you and say thank you to every one uh, of you here. You make a difference in our daily lives. And I appreciate that very much. And America appreciates it. And with that, I turn the program back over to Patricia. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Bob. So moving into our next, um, oh, moving into our next section, where I'm going to talk a little bit more about the work that um, we've done as Americans for the Arts in this field, um, and highlight some of that that conversation to help set us up for the panel discussion. In order to do that, though, I need to share my screen. And can I get some help with being able to share um, share my PowerPoint from our lovely tech folks? You got it, Patricia. Awesome. Thank you, Drew. Cool. Okay. Let's get over here. Oops, push the button. There we go. All right. So I'm going to talk. To, uh, this presentation is going to be in two parts. Um, it's going to be one is to talk a bit more about the programming that we've done over the past year, 20 years, and then we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, some of the work around year in review um, and some of the projects, some of the trends and thoughts that have kind of come out of those 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 20 years of projects or those eight, over 800 projects that we've acknowledged over the past 20 years. Um, so kind of just to start us off, uh, you know, Bob uh, talked about this a, a, a bit in, in the beginning, um, but I wanted to kind of talk more in depth about the work that's really kind of come out of not only the public art network as a whole, but the public art programs that Americans for the Arts has been running for the past 20 years. And this operates in sort of five different levels. One is around member engagement. Um, for those familiar with Americans for the Arts, we are a member driven organization. Um, and so we do a lot of work around member engagement and making sure that we're providing information needed uh, for members who work um, and make public art happen in their communities. We also do a lot of field recognition um, which really kind of looks at how are we acknowledging those and the, doing, doing great work out there. Uh, communicating the value of public art, um, making sure that people, not only you as people that work in the field, but those um, around the country and in your communities understand the importance that public art brings to your communities. Information resources, so we've developed a lot of those over the years to again help our members and those in the field um, to make sure they have the resources they need and information they need to do this type of work. And of course, we've been doing an annual convening fairly regularly um, over the past 20 years uh, to really bring together, um, you know, people from across the country and even, even folks from, <laughs> from our neighbor up north in Canada and others um, who are doing this work so they can share and meet and mingle and network, um, you know, their information and ideas and really build a community. 
um, of folks that are sitting in this space. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about each of those five sections. I'm gonna start with member engagement here. Um, this really kind of builds out the public art network, I think at sort of its heart of its work, which is really about engaging folks um, who were doing public art work across the country. Um, and we estimate at this point, there's over 1300 of you um, are, that are part of this network as a whole. Um, they engage in different ways. So everyone has sort of their own level of interest and engagement uh, or ability and capacity to engage. Um, our most active one, of course, is our listserv, which has been in existence since around 2004. Um, we have over 500 members that really sit there and they talk fairly regularly about current issues, questions they're having in their, their work and really building a community of you know, knowledge and, um, and just camaraderie of doing similar work um, in communities across the country. Then we have a, a monthly newsletter as well um, that goes out and shares a lot of those other similar inf information that has another sort of 800 people that are, are, that are part of that newsletter on top of the listserv. And then, of course, as uh, Bob mentioned, we have a fantastic advisory council that we've had since around 2000. Um, this is our current sort of lovely faces that we have this year of the of the uh, 16 people that we we work with. Um, we've worked with you know several of you that I'm sure they're on, on the call now, um, and just sort of thanking everybody. The council really exists as sort of a pipeline between what's happening in the field and helping us sort of make sure that we're staying up to date and current uh, with the issues um, as we work nationally to make sure that we're supporting the public art field across the country. So thank you to everybody who's on the council now and has been on the council in the past. You really have helped make our work um, real um, and impactful. So thank you. Um, another layer of work that we do in our uh, in our public art field is field recognition. So recognizing those are those that are doing great work in the field, as well as the projects that are being are happening out there that are uh, really creating great work of public art works in, in their communities. So we do this. We've done doing this through a couple of different ways um, within the uh, over the years. Um, one is year in review, which I'll talk a little bit later about as well, which is our um, annual event um, that uh, has been running for about 19 years. We are on hold this year as we continue to look over the event and make sure we're creating it the most equitable uh, practices that we can as we continue to recognize projects moving forward. Um, so this is really gonna be looking at um, the intersect, um, you know, acknowledging sort of works that are happening in the field um, and making sure we're giving recognition to all the fantastic projects that happened um, that in communities across the country. Uh, for 19 years, we've also had a leadership award, um, which has been quite exciting. Um, this year uh, was the last year we kind of rolled it off. Um, this is artist Rick Lowe um, was our awardee this year. We've had, a, the program's been in existence since about 2003. And so we're very excited to have Rick Lowe as, as our awardee this year, um, because it helped us kind of bridge the gap and lead us into the next sort of fantastic chapter of this particular type of award. And the leadership award, as well as the one that we're moving on to next, which is which also uh, uh, Bob mentioned, which is a George and Darlene Prez Prize in Public Art and Civic Design is about honoring the individuals. You know, public art just doesn't spring out of the ground. <laughs> um, I think we all on, this, on, on the meeting know that. Um, and so how are we honoring the individuals that are a part of that conversation? So the leadership award it, that did that. And now thanks in my, very much to the George M. Prez Family Foundation, um, we were able to continue that, but also provide financial uh, support or, or funding towards that as well that we're able to give to the awardees every year moving forward. So Vinnie Bagwell was our inaugural awardee this year. And again, we'll be hearing from her in a moment. So again, just recognizing the individuals um, that we uh, that are out there making this work happen, um, artists, administrators, et cetera, um, that are really making this work happen over, over um, in their communities. Another thing we do is information resources. Um, this looks very broad and, and different. Um, one of the sort of organizing components of this was in 2017 um, with support from the National Endowment for the Arts uh, was the Public Art Resource Center. Um, this really is just a kind of a, a clearinghouse, if you will, of tools and resources professionals working in the public art field. This isn't just work that, that American City Arts has done. This also highlights resources that are out there around the country. Um, so it's really designed as, as an opportunity to really organize what's out there, see what's out there, um, and identify, you know, uh, uh, and make sure we're, we're hosting and holding the, those, um, those resources up so people can access them as they do their work across the country. And then some of those resources that we've built out over the years um, that are also included in the, in the Public Art Resource Center are, um, these are only sampling. Um, we've done uh, issue briefs and monographs that kind of deep dive into specific, specific topics. Um, we have done surveys of the field. 
we have advocacy tools. Um, we have, uh, the council has worked very hard on uh, best practices. They did one originally around 2005 and they relaunched one in 2016. Um, we did a really fantastic project um, this year also with the Council on the Cultural Equity in the Public Art Field, practice looking at the equities and inequities um, in the field. So again, building out you know, resources and information tools that people can use to kind of understand their work and understand how better to move it forward, hopefully, or more equitably move it forward, um, as well as to make sure you have the information you need to advocate and communicate the value of what you're doing to your communities and your stakeholders um, and decision makers in your communities. And lastly, um, to just to, to, to end off the, this, this section of the presentation is the annual convening. Um, this has morphed over the past 20 years or so and started off initially as a PAM pre-conference, which really focuses on the members of the network itself. About seven or so years ago, um, it morphed into outside, not just being inclusive of the PAN group, but also just um, anybody that was doing public art. They didn't necessarily have to be part of the membership. Um, and so we moved that into the public art pre-conference and have called it that sense to really kind of be able to embrace um, anybody that's doing that work. And since then I've had a 41% increase of attendees to that, to that event, uh, to the point where we've been able to really build it out um, this past year and really thinking more thoughtfully forward because of the increase of attendees um, and, and interest in people in doing this work is doing a public art and civic design conference that really looks at that intersection of art and, and civic design practices. And by civic design, we're looking at, you know, planning, land use development, transportation. So um, those are the ways that things have morphed and because of the field has grown and people that have, have participated in it. So from there, um, I'm gonna kind of jump into um, the year in review work. Um, so the, the Public Art Network year in review has been around for about 20 years. Um, and again, it started off as an opportunity to highlight up to 50 artworks um, annually. Uh, that are outstanding, that provide excellence to the field. And it's really been sort of this fantastic plethora of projects that really kind of span um, an amazing uh, two decades um, and really dive deep into a lot of issues um, as well as just being beautiful pieces um, on top of you know, everything else. So it's been really kind of a fantastic to be able to dive into that as much, um, the 800 projects that are currently listed in there and think about what that really means. Now, the challenge I had, of course, is I have three minutes to talk about everything that I learned, <laughs> um, which is a fun exercise that I, I don't recommend. Um, so what I did really was kind of started drafting, going through and started thinking really bigly, bigly, that's not a word, um, really big um, about how, you know, public art really kind of morphs and shows itself uh, within within communities, right? So you have sort of these uh, very, you know, inf large infrastructure projects that really came out of um, a lot of hard work between administrators and advocating for the way artworks can be help beautify spaces um, that are really just sort of, to be quite honest, quite, quite bland infrastructure projects and make them more unique and interesting to the community. So you have pieces here from New York in their metro system and uh, as well as from the highway system um, in uh, Pima, Arizona here, um, which is sort of a, a you know one way that public art has shown itself uh, in, in communities. And then you have sort of these kind of fun and quirky projects that also happen as well and this sort of conversation around temporary um, projects um, and what they can do. Uh, you know, one of the, the kind of fun projects that came out of the 2000s was this big giant red ball that should have showed up randomly in places. Um, this one in Portland uh, in 2006. And then you have these more um, sort of tactile projects um, where you have people knitting into the fence um, that not only had knitting into the fence, but also includes um, a sound component. When people walk by, they get a positive message about how beautiful they are, how amazing they're doing. Um, that was done around 2011 and recognized in 2000, uh, that was done in 2010 and recognized in 2000, 2011. Um, so really sort of these very temporary, but yet impactful and kind of fun and almost quirky projects um, that you see come out of it. And you have these, um, you know, these these sort of uh, really permanent um, and established projects that that happen as well. These two happen to be in um, two individual universities, one in Oregon and one in, in, in Texas, um, that are really kind of these more permanent, um, beautiful pieces that are there to help the spaces uh, be more dynamic and interesting, as well as reflect what's going on in those particular locations. Um, so you have one here uh, from from Texas by Larry Kirkland, and one here by Ralph Helmick. Um, up in Oregon. And then continuing, you know, just sort of thinking again about how these, these works sort of really kind of uh, 
they're, they're sort of like what what they are um, and how they've they've sort of developed over the years. But then there's also thinking about what they really do for us as people and as humans, and really sort of define us, um, define our communities. And so there's this is a, a an example of, of that um, here from Louisville. Um, was a series of temporary pieces they did to help encourage their community to come down towards their river. Um, and the, each of these artworks represent the sort of forgotten, if you will, or past histories um, of peoples that have been in the city. So how do you recognize those who have come before you? Um, and sort of that understanding of, um, of, you know, be, of self-reflection, of understanding where, you, where we've come from, and also maybe in a way thinking about where, we, where you're going. And then we see projects like this as well. Um, that really start to reflect um, the things that aren't comfortable to talk about, but we really need to think about um, on our own as well. And um, we have Conflict Kitchen here, excuse me, we have Conflict Kitchen here from 2010 in Pittsburgh um, that was uh, artists uh, serving food that from only from places where Americans, at the time anyway, um, were in conflict with or at war with. Um, so Afghan food was served out of here, et cetera. And then you have a project here um, from Philadelphia. Uh, these were um, a series of murals that an artist did um, about um, being human beings and about immigration um, and immigration control in this country that was that was done within a relative distance of the detention center in Philadelphia. Um, so how were we reflecting back on ourselves and public art really sits in that space as well. Um, it not only goes from sort of this beautification, um, but also talking about our histories and reflecting our histories and thinking about where we are in place and time. And as they continue to go through, you know, the 800 projects and think about, you know, everything I think we do now, um, at least since March, um, is sort of clouded with a, a new, lack of a better term, a new normal or thinking differently about where we are in the world. Um, and what's happened since then, we've had, you know, a pandemic that is currently is still raging out of control in the United States. Um, we have an economic downturn that's devastated not only the arts and culture world, but us as individuals. And we also have issues like racial injustice, um, white supremacy, that systems that hold people down and uh, cause death. And though this isn't a project that is part of the year in review, I couldn't really get past talking about public art or talking about the past 20 years without really bringing up something as iconic as this piece. Um, though I'm not from this community, um, nor am I a, a black person or an African-American person, I think the role of public art in being able to heal communities and being able to talk about the challenges that we face is really part of the conversation as well. And so I don't really have any answers for you from looking into all of that. And I wish I did um, have some sort of amazing thought that was like, here, let's take this into the future. But um, I am, and I think a lot of us out there still are still figuring out where, where we're trying to go. Um, but we know that there's challenges. We also know that Public art in of itself also helps people heal and can help us move forward. So um, with that, um, I also wanna say thank you to everybody. Uh, this, you know, this event really set up as a celebration originally of, of AFTA's work, but quite frankly, we wouldn't be here without all of you, uh, without your support, without your engagement, without your, um, your, your insights and your knowledge and just all the work you're doing out there. Um, it inspires me and it keeps me going. Um, and I hope you continue to inspire each other. Um, and really look at the community, uh, communities you work with um, and know that you're doing amazing work out there. So with that, um, I'm gonna do a quick introduction of our three panelists, and then um, we're gonna allow them to do a unique type of introduction of themselves. Um, so today we have Vinnie Bagwell, who's the artist and 2020 recipient of the George and Darlene Perez Prize in Public Art and Civic Design, who's also joined by Patricia Hanna, who's the art director for the Related Group, and Kendall Henry, who's the percent for art director for New York's City Department of Cultural Affairs and also a former PAN Council member. So I'm gonna welcome each of you. <laughs> um, uh, and thank you so much for coming on for us today. And so what we decided to do for, um, oh, I didn't mean to un go from there. Let's go back to that. Um, so what we're gonna do is that, um, um, what I asked each of the, each of the panelists to do um, is to provide uh, an image of an artwork that they felt um, really kind of reflected either the what's going on with today or reflected you know public art over the past 20 years and really you know kind of talk about given give an opportunity to talk about a piece that kind of meant something to them and means something to either what we're going through now as a country or what we have been going for the past 20 years it was very open very broad 
um, and looking at the intersection also of art and community and the role it plays in communities. Um, and so with that, um, the first piece, and I realized I didn't tell any of you the order. So um, hopefully <laughs> hopefully we're gonna talk and think at our feet. Um, is the first project we're gonna have is, is Vicky talk about her piece um, as a way by way of introduction as and as well as for you all who are listening to understand how they think um, and as a way to kind of uh, a preference and uh, build a foundation for our conversation we're gonna be having with the panel moving on. So Vinny, take it away. Hi there. Um, am I supposed to give you my face again or do you just get the unmute part? I'm sorry. Um, you can show your face. People would love to see you, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, how to do it. Um, uh -oh. All right, whatever. Hi, I'm Vinnie Badwell. And um, this is Victory. Victory is a sculpture that I, this says hide self, but I, I'm, I don't know if I'm hidden or not. Victory is a sculpture that I designed for a competition for the city of New York in 2019. Um, there was a call for art uh, to replace the J. Marion Sims public artwork that was on Central uh, Park outside of uh, 103 on Fifth Avenue. And um, the call asked to celebrate the women. If you're not familiar with J. Marion Sims, he's the father of gynecology. And um, sculpture uh, was removed uh, because the community uh, fought for about 10 years to have it removed because this is a, a doctor who uh, is renowned uh, for his accomplishments in OBGYN, um, but he gained that by experimenting on enslaved African women uh, without anesthesia or uh, painkillers. You know, he did all kinds of experiments. And so uh, the reason why the artwork is important to me um, is because uh, it was amazing to me how um, deeply the community embraced this artwork. Um, it, it was a tremendous experience to, uh, first of all, uh, find that the Harlem and East Harlem community was an extremely um, educated and, and deeply motivated uh, community that knew black history. So for instance, um, at some point during my competition, someone asked about uh, why this was such a European approach. And uh, before I could answer, you know, someone stood up and explained that, you know, a lot of African culture was stolen by uh, European cultures. And so a lot of people think that things are European when really uh, they're from Egypt. And then someone else jumps up and starts talking about ISIS. And I just found it really amazing um, how people in some ways understood this work and in other ways um, did not have quite clarity. So I wanted to present this um, also to, again, because of the way that the community embraced this artwork, it brought tremendous attention to me and my practice. Um, the media embraced it. Uh, it's just been an incredible journey talking about this. Um, the reason why I selected to talk about this particular artwork also too um, is because this is the year of the woman. And we are celebrating uh, women gaining the ability to vote and women gaining uh, the ability to have a voice. Uh, the other aspect uh, is that this is uh, a year after the 400th anniversary of uh, slavery. And so, uh, it's amazing that it's been 400 years, it's 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation and black people still have to fight for equality. We still have to fight for uh, a voice in public art. And so, um, you know, these are the things uh, that really keep me motivated um, for being in the public art round. I feel like it's my duty to create art that represents the history, the achievement, the aspirations of people of color. And I am so sorry, I haven't been able to figure out how to put my face back in. <clears throat> Vinny, there's a um, video icon at the bottom of your screen. Oh, there you go. Hi. We see you, lovely. Thank you. Um, so that's, that's, you know, pretty much, um, 
you know, what I want to say about this artwork. Um, if you can see it, you can tell it's it's my classic style. It's representational figurative artwork. Um, there is bar relief on the body of the sculpture, which is narrative, which helps to expand uh, the story. And so, you know, as a storyteller, um, it's important for me to connect with people of all colors. It's, it's this is about connecting to people. It doesn't have anything to do with color or culture or nationality or ethnicity or anything like that. Anyone should be able to walk up to this artwork and have a grasp of what this story is. And so um, at this point, uh, we're all very concerned. You know, pandemic has made a tremendous impact on public art, uh, particularly in New York City, because all public art projects are uh, suspended. Um, at this point, we're waiting for the Oversight Committee and uh, the Cultural Affairs Department to speak to the mayor to see if it's possible to unsuspend this particular project. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, there's tremendous interest in it. Um, for people who are interested in seeing the Mac Cat, uh, it'll be on view at the Hudson River Museum until January 22nd. And um, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Wonderful, thank you so much, Vinny. Um, up next, we have, oh, if I can get this to move forward. We have Patty. Hi, thank you all for having me and thank you to Americans for the Arts for including me in this wonderful conversation. All the images are, are so inspiring already. Uh, so I just, can you guys hear me okay? Just wanted to. Yes. Sound good. Okay. So I, um, I'm coming, I guess, from a little bit of a different background. Um, I am a, a curator coming, usually working in, in museums and, and nonprofit settings. And for the last nine years, I've been the art director for the Related Group, which is a real estate development company um, whose founder and chairman is George Perez, um, as you all heard, who's a local um, philanthropist and collector. And so something that's ingrained in our corporate culture is to incorporate artwork into every one of our projects, not only in the interior spaces and all the common areas, but also um, on the exterior of buildings and in, and in the, the, public, the public realm as well. So I guess for me, it's an interesting uh, take because I think the the developer becomes a patron of public art. So we work with the city officials, we work with our art in public places. Um, but, you know, for me, it's been a, a great luxury to be able to curate these very special projects throughout my own city. I'm a Miami native. And when we were going to build this building in Wynwood, I don't know if you're familiar with Miami, but Wynwood was a working, you know, class, mostly Puerto Rican neighborhood. Um, also house uh, warehouses, shoe manufacturers, uh, garment manufacturers. And um, over the years, it's been changing and it's become primarily Miami's arts and entertainment districts with galleries and um, restaurants, but it was a place where um, most of the street art originated in Miami. And so when we came into Wynwood and we were going to work on this project, we found ourselves having this you know, huge canvas, uh, essentially the whole facade of the building. And, um, and so being in Miami in the early 2000s when the Wynwood Walls were happening, there were many artists that were um, you know, working within the neighborhood. And I thought, well, what a great opportunity it would be if I were to invite one of these artists back, you know, 10, 12 years later, back to Wynwood to create this magnificent monument, I guess, to, to the neighborhood. And so I invited El Mac, who's an artist that's based in, in California. He had done some murals in Miami, again, like I said, in 2007, 2008. And so we invited him back to the neighborhood and I asked him to revisit the project and go out into the streets of Wynwood, back into the neighborhood, you know, document the people that live there, the people that work there. And so he, you know, was in Miami for, for months, you know, getting to know the, the, the residents. And he ended up taking photographs of, you know, many different people. And we decided, he decided that this would be uh, how he was going to, his tribute to the neighborhood. So it's called A Love Supreme Winwood Saints. 
And so their images of like the, the, the girl all the way to the left is a person who attends to a community garden in Wynwood. Um, the boy in the middle is a dancer who um, dances in, in one of the academies in, in the neighborhood. And the boy all the way to the right um, lives in the neighborhood and he is of uh, Seminole descent, um, the Florida um, community here. And so really what we wanted to do was memorialize the place and the people that live there. So we wanted to, to have a memory of, you know, to commend the people that, that to create a sense of place so that they would have a, a sense of belonging, you know, despite the changes in the neighborhood that were happening and, and the development and the building. And if you, you can't tell from this picture, but this building is, is stands out in, in, in all of Miami. You can see it from major intersections. You can see it from many different places. So it's become like the, the, the beacon of Wynwood. And we love the fact that it stands for the people that are actually living there. Um, so that was our tribute to the neighborhood. If you have any questions, of course, we'd be happy to address them afterwards. Fantastic, thank you so much, Patty. Okay, up next is Kendall. Thank you for Patricia. Um, and I just wanna congratulate Vinnie Bagwell on her award. Um, and I have the pleasure of working with Vinnie on her project that she, uh, she talked about. Uh, when I was asked to sort of pick a, a project that um, sort of sort of exemplified 20 years of public art, I had a really tough time. I, there were so many projects that came to mind, um, but I, I, I knew there were going to be a lot of um, public art folks on, on this, um, this Zoom chat. So I just wanted to sort of bring up a number of things in terms of uh, how do we interpret a work or who gets to interpret the work or uh, who gets to determine what the work is about. And so I picked this piece by, by Hank Willis Thomas, which we, um, which we installed actually last year, almost to the year on, on Veterans Day. And um, if you know anything about Hank's work, you know he sort of uses the human body um, and sort of uses this, uh, this idea of identity in a lot of his work. And, and so this is very uh, in keeping with the work. Just to give you an idea of where this is, um, as you walk across the Brooklyn Bridge into Brooklyn, one of the things that you see on that, that trip is the Statue of Liberty in the distance. And you know, the gesture that she makes and what she stands for sort of was part of what influenced this, this piece of, of this work here, this, this sculpture, which is about 22 feet tall um, out of bronze. And, and so the artwork on the left is, is about that. And um, it's, it's about you know, what Brooklyn stands for. It's about you know, unity, it's about one love, it's about, you know, the gesture of you know, you know all these things that that is that is evoked in that. Um, Hank on purposefully you know made it a uh, appear to be a black male arm. Um, there's very few representations of of black people in general in 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 our sculpture in in our in our in in, in the city and in everywhere. And so he was it, the patina of it itself made sure that it was a black arm, and the model for that arm is is a basketball player. Uh, who's an immigrant uh, from Cameroon, and he's um, a member of the um, Philadelphia 76ers. I'm not going to tell who it is. You can do your research yourself. We got to keep some secrets. So, so, and and the the artwork on the left is also, you know, it means to a, a six year old um, that this person has something to say. He's raising his hand. He has something important to say because it's a big arm. So, that's how certain interpretations are for this. The artwork in the middle is an ISIS symbol to, to certain people, to actually one individual who used the press to, um, to amplify that, that interpretation of that, that work. And, and so, you know, and having say, saying that it's an ISIS symbol during Veterans Day sort of added to a bit of a controversy for this piece. And the artwork on the right is um, a celebration or a call to action uh, it's, it punctuates what was happening during the summer around the murder of George Floyd. And, and it has sort of been that, and this is sort of the new meaning that, that, it, that stuck with it, um, even after just a year of it, of it being in existence. And, um, and so now this is, the work, see, the work is seen as a, a work of uh, empowerment, uh, particularly for, for the black community, particularly for the black community in, 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 um, in Brooklyn. And, 
what was interesting is that I start seeing this work over and over again as a form of empowerment, um, right? Just yesterday, when a uh, someone who's you know running for politics used that as the background for his sort of inaugural announcement uh, in in the political field. So, so you know, using this one single artwork with so many different meanings you know, begs the question, particularly when we're looking at monuments now, particularly when we're looking at the artworks that, that are in, you know, in, in our, around us, you know, who gets to, who gets to rep be represented? Uh, who gets to do that representation? And whose meaning of that uh, representation gets to stick and, and we get to honor? So, so, um, so yeah, so this is uh, what, I, what I wanted to put forward and talk about. And I hope uh, a lot of what we unfold uh, comes out of the conversation. So there you have it. I just want to say hi to everybody because I, I see a lot of y'all on on the uh, on the participants list, and uh, I miss you. And I miss this sort of the year interview because I was always very exciting to see what, what came up in that. So so thank you for that opportunity. Great, thank you, thank you all three of you. I'm gonna stop sharing so we can see all of our beautiful faces again. So. Kendall, Patty, and Vinny, if you want to hop on um, on your video um, as we get ready. Um, again, as a reminder, um, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in, not pop, or type them <laughs> into the Q&A um, uh, box at the bottom of your screen. Um, you know, and, and we'll be monitoring that throughout. Um, and also feel free to participate in the conversation um, in the chat box as well. Um, so again, you know, I really appreciated the three of you. You came at, um, you know, your, your, your intersection with, with public art from a very personal perspective. And I appreciate that. I think that's something that's not always easy to talk about sometimes. So I appreciate the, the courage that it takes to, to do that type of, do that type of talking and, and to select those artworks. Um, I do want to start us off though, kind of to where, um, I kind of heard sort of a thread between all three of you. Um, you know, with with uh, with Vinny around this notion of sort of meaning and storytelling, um, and sort of the narrative that's told um, through through public art. Um, I heard through Vinny, you know, talking about that that's something that you really crave for your sculpture, and um, that anybody can it's accessible. Anybody can come up to it and see its de definition, or its understanding of where it's coming from. Um, Patty, the story you told of, of who's represented in, in your in the work that you showed, and Kendall, the the um, Sort of, sort of switching of the of the meaning of the work, um, depending on who was looking at it and sort of how it was being utilized uh, for the piece you showed. So I, I, you know, I'd love to kind of hear from you guys diving deep into that a little bit more. Um, how do we how do we talk about that meaning to kind of, you know, how do we dive into that? How do we, you know, control is such an ugly word, but how do we how do we ensure that the, the proper meaning maybe is being being ex explained through an artwork? Or that we're we're making sure that the most positive or whatever the sort of original artist's intent, if you will, is really being explained through, through a piece. Um, I'm gonna bug Kendall to start off because he asked those questions <laughs> as well as part of his. Um, and then um, Vinny and Patty, feel free to jump in as well um, where, where you feel so. Yeah. Well, I asked the question because I hope to get some answers. So you know that that's where I was coming from. But I think um, yeah, and so that's something that that that. You know, I think anybody who co commissions public art um, sort of deals with it. Sort of, how do we um, not? Yeah, and the word control is hard, um, but but I think it sort of starts with the artist and sort of really trusting that because when we select an artist, we want to hear from them in their voice. And when we talk about creating a work that's site specific or relates to the artist's practice, we kind of hope that 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 voice or that that the meaning behind that comes through in what they do and and how they address the work. Um, sometimes um, when, and so that's where we begin. And a lot of the misinterpretations of a work comes out of, you know, having other people be the first speakers on behalf of the work. Mm. And, and sometimes it's just a matter of uh, coming to the forefront and saying, this is what it is. So, so this is how people begin to look at it. Uh, another issue might be that uh, sometimes it's too open for interpretation, and that's good and bad. Um, and and then accepting that the many different interpretations that arise is valid, and and use that as a a taking off point for conversation. Because in the end, when we commission a work of art, we don't want it to disappear in the in the background. We want it to be keep activating uh, and engaging in that kind of conversation. Um, 
particularly with current and public art that's going to be there forever. We want to mm -hmm. always keep it, you know, active in conversation. So um, that being said, I don't know that it's a bad thing that there are many different interpretations. Uh, I think that we should make a space for uh, accepting those interpretations and having conversations around them and using them as a taking off point for engagement. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kendall. Um, Vinny, do you have any, anything to add? I do. I think that um, uh, my experience with public art is that um, people value storytelling. They value learning about history um, because history is the memory of people. And so oftentimes those are the kinds of calls that I respond to. So mostly I'm doing people. Of course, there's all kinds of public art. You know, there's abstract, there's the all kinds of, of ways that different artists experience and tell a story. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be representational, it doesn't have to be literal, um, but I think it is important that the work connect with people because that's the whole purpose. And so um, there's no accounting for taste. Um, and so, you know, this is why oftentimes you try to have civic engagement involved. And by the way, thank you very much for my prize. I was so just, combobulated before with my screen not coming on, I forgot to say thank you for the prize. Um, I think it's really, really important um, that civic engagement be always be involved when you're doing uh, art for public places, because again, you're making the artwork for the public. So it's always helpful to have their feedback and their input and their insights, because it helps the artist to create an artwork that's well balanced. So that's, that's my take on it. Oh, thank you, Patty. Yeah, I I was I second I think what Kendall says also. I think that the more open it is, the more the better it is. I feel like you know if if we saw an artwork once and figured it out, and you know it wouldn't be so it wouldn't continually continuously engage the community. So I think that you know that the fact that an artwork can be interpreted in many different ways. Um, I think it, it's totally okay. I think it's, it's, that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to be thought provoking and it's meant to spark a conversation. And I think that one, at one moment you may think a certain way towards uh, a piece, but that you, you look at it again and it makes you think something differently or it changes your perception or, um, so I think that's exactly what we strive to do um, with these pieces. And so I, I'm, the more open it is to interpretation, I think the more interesting it could be um, for the community. That being said, I think there's also pieces that are, um, you know, and things that we've done around the city that are perhaps more abstract um, and really are just beautiful. And I think that's okay too. You know, I think it's okay to also have pieces that you just admire for their beauty for what they are. Um, and so I think that 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 whole range is so important and to have different projects throughout the city that complement each other and, and kind of work around this open conversation makes the city even more interesting. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I want to I want to kind of poke at that sort of um, kind of relationship between, you know, community and, and the artwork itself. Um, uh, talking and thinking a little bit about um, also the notion of, of this idea of permanence, which has been sort of an ongoing conversation in the public art field for a while. What do we mean by permanence? What does that, what that really look like? Um, I think it really came to a head uh, this year and even in 2017 with the taking down of, of monuments and, mo and memorials uh, to Confederate soldier, soldiers and in, um, in the Lost Cause movement. Um, you know, what, what does that really look like when you're talking about permanence and you're, you're creating an artwork with the particular community involved or thought of, or engaged with or part of that conversation. What does that really mean? Um, and I'm kind of curious what you guys think about that um, and just sort of this notion of permanence in relationship to communities um, as things change, as, as our world changes, our communities change um, on a regular basis. Uh, Vinny, would you like to take a crack at that first? I think that um, what, what I find interesting about public art um, is that, again, you have a lot of communities that are revitalizing. You have a lot of communities that um, are already well established, like for instance, New York City. Um, there's a tremendous 
breadth of what a community might be like in this country. Um, but I think that the, the beauty of now uh, is that people are becoming more and more imaginative and uh, visionary about what could be, you know, rather than dwelling on what is or what has been, um, the question is what, what else can we do to make our cities and our towns and our homes more livable, um, you know, to bring quality of life, um, to bring excitement, um, to create destinations and things like that. And so um, I just think this is a really, really exciting time for conceiving and creating public art. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Patty, any thoughts? Um, when I think about permanence, I think that um, I kind of see it as a, a chain reaction, kind of following what Vinny says. So permanence, um, maybe not of a specific artwork, but permanence on the practice of continuing to better our cities. Um, mm. So, you know, we, maybe some projects don't last forever. Maybe they are uh, ephemeral, maybe, um, you know, conservation issues or, you know, and that's, you know, maybe physicality or physical permanence. Um, but I think that what we do kind of um, creates a long-term permanence because it's, it's a practice and it's ongoing. And so one project leads to another, which leads to another and, mm -hmm. you know, open spaces become more important and, you know, the development of neighborhoods become important. And so I think in terms of what we're doing, um, we're, we're kind of leading the way for a permanence and for a continuity for all of our cities. And so that's kind of I, how I see the, the, the permanence of it. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Kendall? And I'm going to add to everything, what everybody says. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of in, in separate it into two different kinds of questions, maybe, um, or directions. So first is uh, we have to try to figure out the word community is so broad mm -hmm. and the word community around anything is very broad and it could be, is it the community of um, that of the group of people that shared a geographic location? Is it a, is community the group of people who share um, a similar background or, you know, racial makeup or class or ethnicity or whatever it is. And, and so, so that, and, and then it becomes a, who defines the community. And then how that relates to permanence is like uh, when we when we do a work, any any kind of uh, public artwork, we sort of really tap into um, having the voice of the community be part of that work, having the work reflect the community. And again, mm -hmm. the community in a very broad sense it could be very you know. And we don't. We're, I'm not the one that's defining what community is. Is the folks that that are um, choose to participate, the folks that are going to live with the work, they're the ones that are responsible for defining that. And, and so how that plays into, so you, you do a work that reflects this particular community, whatever that is. And then um, in places like New York City where communities change constantly, there's a flow of inflow and what used to be, you know, little mm -hmm. Italy is now, you know, little China, it used to be, you know, because it's just people are just flowing around. And so some of the, the question becomes, well, if you create a work that's very specific to that community and the community change, the new, how does the new community respond to that permanent work? Uh, and again, that's a question. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, some, and the answer is, well, it's, it's always good to have a record of who used to be here. And, and that's mm -hmm. as valid as well. Um, so this is sort of like the what questions and, and thoughts that we think about when we think about what permanence mean and, and how do we reflect the community within that permanent artwork. For the city, for New York City, we have an actual definition of permanent mm. and, and temporary uh, for uh, technical definition. And so temporary is anything that's a year or less and permanent is anything that's um, over a year and about 30 years, okay? And, and, and that's sort of, so, so and that, that may not um, be appropriate for anybody else in terms of that definition of permanence. But, but these are some of the things that we think about is um, and, and the other part of that is I'm, I'm going to cut off my little tangent here is that, um, um, and how does that, when it, when it's permanent, when it's up for a long time, the meanings change depending on who's looking at it and, and it becomes a different kind of experience and it becomes uh, a different artwork completely, um, during time. Cause we, we, we look at a work 
with the eyes of what's happening around us at the time and who's seeing it too. So, and so that's a lot of the issues that we're having with a lot of the monuments right now. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's been there forever and may, may have had a different meaning when it was put up. And so it's, it's, so all that is sort of balled into one. I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's totally fine, Kendall. Um, I, I do want to kind of continue that thread a bit more of kind of what I was hearing um, from the three of you around this notion of permanence. Um, and I'd love to kind of just talk about, I feel like a lot of what sort of came out of some of the monument conversation, I think to, in some part is also around responsibility. Um, and I know the three of you have a very different perspective, come from here from, you know, different perspectives in, in, in the world of public art, from an artist, administration, curatorial, um, thinking about that, that type of responsibility for, for when things change, you know, who, who's really part of being, you know, the ownership of that, of, of stewarding the artwork itself. Um, I know there's a conservation and sort of caring for the artwork and the material itself. That's that's one part of it, um, but really sort of responsible for so the content and how it's perceived or its intention um, and how it relates to either the changing of the communities or the changing of ideas. Um, anybody want to take that one first or I can pick people? <laughs> Patty, I'll go to you. <laughs> so, yeah, I think like like I said before, I'm coming from a from a different perspective because I'm coming in from a real estate development company, right? And so, um, at least for from our perspective, um, we we don't want it to be like a wild west. So, just because you're building a building, then you get to choose and you get to you know place an artwork in the city or put a mural on the building and, you know, who's to, you know, who's going to say otherwise. And, you know, so I think that for us, it's a very huge responsibility leaving, changing the city's landscape. Um, and so I think that it's, it's extremely important to have collaborators and to, to be, to have open dialogue and conversations with the, not only the arts community, but the you know the city and and the county and art in public places and so um for us that is a huge responsibility um coming from you know the outside in terms of these public art projects uh so i think it's for us it's of utmost importance um to keep those dialogues open and to work with the city to achieve the goals um you know we set out common goals that we all want to achieve um, so that's something that we obviously have to take really seriously. Thank you. And I'm gonna like hop on to what Patty said about the dialogue because that that's very important. And coming from the perspective of um, a city like New York and you know being in charge of all of the collection, past, present, and future, um, when a work is problematic, I think um, understanding why it is, but with a knowledge of what the meaning was initially. And of course, meanings change and times change and what something meant before in good, um, coming from a place of good uh, may, may not be realized as such today. Um, so that, that dialogue and that conversation and, and really listening and really hearing and giving people an opportunity and a safe space to feel like they could say what they need to say and respecting that is very important to determine what happens to a, an individual piece or, um, and, and how that dialogue addresses how we move forward in the future when we are commissioning new work. What, what do we need to think about? So I think uh, it's not a, a quick and dirty answer, but I think the key to anything that, that happens is listening and, and engaging in a dialogue, not just with just the people involved, but with people outside of that as well. Um, because again, me coming from New York City, we, we're not building a community-based collection. We're building a, a, an international, national, and a, a city-based collection. So diversity um, in the artists that are creating the work, diversity in the work itself is very important. Thank you, Kendall. Can I just add to that really quick? I think it also to respect the process, as you know, there's such an enormous long process that goes into every one of the pieces in terms of community outreach and community meeting, meetings and, um, you know, so I think it, it's so important to respect that process also, um, you know, not only the dialogue, but kind of go through, go through that process to be able to, to reach the common goal. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead, Vinny. Uh, I was just gonna say that um, ideally, I think that, um, 
I think that the municipality should lead the process, um, but I think in, in the process of leading, um, they should be mindful in terms of bringing all the stakeholders into the dialogue. Um, in, in my instance, I'm oftentimes doing public artworks about people, people who are living, people you know who are historical, whatever the case may be. So, you know, how you look at, at, for instance, the kind of work I do versus other kinds of artwork might be different. Um, and so, example, J. Marion Sims. I had somebody um, say something, you know, challenging to me on social media because the issue was about throwing away, um, for instance, the Civil War memorials. And I said, nobody's doing that. I said, what we're doing is that we're removing them, but they're being repurposed and they're being repurposed most of the time mindfully. So for instance, the J. Marion Sims sculpture is in Woodlawn Cemetery, you know, near his grave, which to me seems like, that's not a bad idea. You know, they go in museums. I mean, there are a variety of places where these uh, public artworks that are no longer um, suitable for where they are, where they can go and still be seen, still be seen part as, as part of history, see, still be seen uh, in context, but maybe they're not appropriate for that public realm any longer. So even in the decision making of removing a public artwork or deciding where it goes, it's always important to have um, a balance and a diverse uh, input you know, for feedback so that later, um, for those people who may want to take you to task about it, you can say to them, oh, no, we had talks about this. You know, we had charrettes, we had uh, community forums, we had artist talks, we, you know, we had a discussion. If you missed it, you missed it. But it's not like it wasn't um, given time and thought and, and um, consideration when you decide to change um, a venue for a public artwork. I think, you know, most folks are doing it correctly. Um, and for those people who are just beginning to contemplate um, removing artwork and replacing artwork, I just think that that dialogue and, and civic engagement is probably the most important thing you can do because at least you give people an opportunity to have a voice, to express opinion, um, you know, to talk about their values and what matters. And I think if that's done, you've covered your basis. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I want to poke at that a little bit more because um, I, I don't think we can have any conversation about public art in, in 2020. And we've talked about it a little bit already um, around the notion of, of Confederate memorials and sort of the, the, the removal of, of, of other artworks that have um, not seen particularly favorably anymore because of their histories and what they represent. Um, so let's let's kind of dive that into that a little bit deeper. Um, one of the conversations and what I'm hearing also from Vinny is this notion of sort of contextualization. What does it mean to really kind of contextualize an artwork? Um, what does that really look like? So I'd love to hear from you know anybody on the panel, and of course I'll pick on people, <laughs> um, you know, and sort of your thoughts around that about you know recontextualizing a piece um, versus sort of anything else we could be doing with these works, leaving them in their own place, um, you know, taking them down and, and destroying them all together. Um, sort of that conversation around around sort of the artworks themselves and sort of the, the the possibilities of what we could be doing with them moving forward. I'll start so you don't have to call on me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the things that um, we did a couple of years ago, um, it's a couple of years now, wow, uh, was to, be, particularly because of what was happening with the Confederate monuments, uh, we took a look at the, the monuments that we had in the city's collection that may be problematic. And in addressing that, we, we did something what, what Vinny um, brought up is that we held quite a number of um, open forums uh, for people, just anybody to come and say, you know, whatever they wanna say about whatever sculpture that they've seen that day may be problematic. And then after that, we convened a, um, a, a committee of, of individuals who, who have, uh, uh, really good individuals to sort of really evaluate some of those ideas and, and come up with some suggestions that were was handed to the mayor and then he was to make the ultimate uh, decision. And as a result of that, um, that's why we were able to remove the J. Marion Sims uh, sculpture because, you know, 
it was obviously a, a problem. But then there were others that were on the, the precipice of, is it really a problem and whatever? And, and, and it, it, has, it, it was a little more complicated than just that. And um, one was the Christopher Columbus, which I'm not going to talk about. But another one was the, um, the statue in the front of the American Museum of Natural History of Teddy Roosevelt. And you know, upon doing research on that work, it was never meant to be what it is interpreted as now. Right back in when it was installed, um, and the figures. If you don't know the image, it's sort of Teddy Roosevelt is on a horse, and on one side is a is a, is a black man, uh, an African, and the other side is a Native American uh, man, and they they were meant to represent Africa, the continent, and uh, North America, but initially, but again with time we saw it a little differently, and and you know Teddy as a white man is above these two individuals who are on foot and while he's on the horse. So visually it's a problem. And as part of that, you know, the, the museum chose to recontextualize uh, or, or add more context really to the entire work in an exhibition in the museum. And, uh, and they, I was very surprised for an institution to be very hard on themselves, which rightfully so, and really, you know, questioned a lot of the decisions that were made around that. Uh, really highlighted the the negative issues, connotations, interpretations, and put it to the forefront of that conversation. And um, and they used that to a certain extent to determine what was to happen to the work um, after that. And it was decided to remove the work after all, because indeed it was painful. It is a very painful thing for you know persons of color, particularly Native Americans or black people to see that all the time. It's gigantic, it's huge, mm -hmm. you can't miss it. And every time, everybody wants to go to the museum and boom, there it is. Uh, so, so they decided to, to remove it. And I think um, contextualization is very important or adding more information to the work is very important. So people could see a, a greater, have a greater understanding of, of what it is that they're looking at. And, um, and sometimes as a result of that, it may be, a decision to remove it, or it may be a decision to keep it up and have more conversations, but to do it piece, piece by piece, I think is, in, is important because again, mm -hmm. there is lessons to be learned about these things and there's valuable lessons that we do not want to repeat again. And so, you know, we don't want to lose these opportunities to learn those lessons. Oh, absolutely, thank you. I'll, I'll take a... So I guess my, I don't, I have a different experience um, from Kendall and Vinnie perhaps, um, but I agree that I think contextualization and dialogue again is extremely important. And I think that going through the steps to be able to come to an informed and, and well thought out decision is, um, is, is the way to go. And I have a little bit of a, a different experience. We placed a sculpture outside of a building by a, a, a Haitian artist that lives in Miami, Edward Duval Carrier. And, you know, the people in, in the neighborhood were, you know, they didn't understand it. And it was, um, you know, he works with, you know, images of, um, um, you know, religious icons and syncretism, you know, Haitian Caribbean um, influence. And so people didn't understand it they 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 reacted really negative to it and there was all these complaints and they wanted to remove the the sculpture and they didn't want that in their neighborhood and you know they couldn't relate to it and and um and as much as as we tried to communicate that information it wasn't really you know we, we weren't getting anywhere so we held, held a community meeting we had the artists come and we had them explain the work and you know the background and contextualize it and we you know the reason you know the reason behind it and and all of that and after you know a very long and drawn out conversation with the community everyone said well this was so helpful we finally understand what this piece actually is and we're happy to have it in our neighborhood um so in that case you know it worked out where dialogue conversation a mutual understanding um had a positive outcome so i think that's you know from my experience i think it's all a matter of it's it's conversation and it's talking and it's and you know, don't put it away and don't shut it off. Let's bring it out into the open. Let's have an open conversation about it. Why is it negative or why is it positive or why should we take it yeah. down and why should it stay? So I think that's so important in the process. Thank you. This is an interesting question. Um, 
again, talking about history, uh, you have sculptures like Columbus at Columbus Circle. You have um, the Jefferson Memorial, there's one, you know, again, you know, people sometimes come for me on social media every now and then. And uh, I had somebody ask me, so are you suggesting that we take down the Jefferson Memorial? Well, I said, I might. And I said, I really like that. I, I really like that sculpture. I said, if they asked me, I would maybe, as you say, change the context, you know, you could add to it. There are things you could do to expand the story. Um, this is the job of the artist. The artist is the one who comes up with solutions, uh, practical uh, answers for how to make things work. Because ultimately, interpretation uh, is pretty much kind of what we do. So I think mm -hmm. that, um, there, there are a number of artworks that are like that, that are so iconic, that have been there for so long. Um, because they represent a particular history. The question is simply is, you know, can you make that artwork still work in a present day context? Kind of like the one mm -hmm. that you talked about at, um, you know, the Museum of Natural History. That one you cannot, you, you know, people have weighed in it and said, nope, it's not happening. But, you know, again, and again, I'm gonna use the Jefferson Memorial because it's such a, a massive, iconic American, uh, uh, monument, it's like, oh, we might not want to destroy that, but we might be able to do something to make it work and be the truth and, and be able to be acceptable. But all of that still requires quite a bit of thought. You know, you have to be mindful because again, the question is what story do you want to really tell? Hmm. So um, context is really, really important. Um, I'm working on a project in Montgomery, New York. It's a burial ground. And again, talking to New York State about what matters when you're doing a burial ground. Well, mm -hmm. you know, if you're talking about one that goes back to the 1700s, it's the issue is preservation. Um, and you have to be real careful about how you approach it with public art if you're trying to preserve the pristine nature of something that's just so natural. It's like, you have to be careful. So I think that um, contextualizing something is needed, mm. um, tremendously valuable, um, but I think you have to really take your time with it. I think you really have to be careful about it. And, um, and when you finally come to the conclusion, you say what you mean, and then you gotta mean what you say. Mm. Very true. So let's, um, I, I, I love what you, you were saying about how this is, you know, the contextualization and a lot of those conversations can really kind of build off from the artist. So, uh, you know, my next question really kind of centers around, so what's the role of the artist in some of these conversations? Um, you know, which is kind of an interesting conversation when some of the artists have been dead for, you know, a couple hundred years. Um, but but what, what is the, what, what can the role of, of the artist play either in an artwork that's, you know, fairly contemporary to where artists can really be part of a conversation to address, um, you know, situations where the artwork is, you know, not, is, is older and then the, the, the person that, that originally uh, conceived of it is, is no longer around. Um, so I'd be curious kind of hear your thoughts um, on that. Um, oh, Vinny, do you wanna? <laughs> um, that's kind of what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, for me, it begins with the call for art. You know, when I'm scrolling, you know, through call for entry or public artists, whatever I'm looking through, um, first of all, I'm looking for artwork that resonates with me. I'm, I need to care. And the more I care, the more it shows. Mm -hmm. So I think for the first thing uh, for an artist is to um, prioritize their values. What, what do I call myself doing? What, what matters the most to me? Um, for me, it, although I, I do this for a living, I don't do it because it's just for the money. I, I do it because I love it. Mm -hmm. I do it because I feel I have a certain responsibility as a black person to represent black people because there are so few black people in the public art arena, I take that responsibility very deeply. Um, and so when I am evaluating a call, the question ultimately is, do I like that? It's like, that sounds interesting. 
And then of course, you know, as I begin to delve into it, usually I like to study the place. What is this place? Um, example would be, um, I saw a call for art for the DC um, Department of General Services. You know, they sent for art and I ignored this call. And uh, the director for the program um, reached out to me and said, why aren't you applying for this call? And I said, I, I didn't think it was for me. And she says, I'd like you to look into it a little deeper. Hmm. And I said, why? She said, because I think it's up your alley. So I was like, okay, let me look at it again because I, I evidently I missed something. So when I went back and read the call again, I still didn't get it. I was like, I don't know why she has me doing this. So as I read the call, something caught my eye. It said the Civil War Memorial Museum wants to use the public art that this artist is creating as part of its walking tours. Hmm. I'm like, walking tours? Now I'm thinking about my neighborhood, okay? And I'm like, if I did a walking tour, what is this neighborhood? So I started you know, researching the neighborhood and I discovered the concept of contraband camps. And when I found out what they were, I was like, oh, I never heard, I've been doing slavery for the last 12 years and I never heard of contraband camps. How is that possible? So I started asking other people, do you know what a contraband camp is? And people were like, no, what is that? Do you know what a contraband camp is? Like, no, what is that? In the 1860s, around the time of the Civil War, understand it, when you have a war, there's a line. Like, this is your side, this is my side. Mm -hmm. If you leave your cannon too close to the line and somebody's not paying attention and I take that cannon, it's my cannon now. So because they thought of enslaved Africans as property, mm. the District of Columbia, like New York, abolished slavery ahead of the rest of the country. Enslaved Africans are escaping, trying to get to DC. And when they hit the DC line, technically they became free. Mm. Well, in the first year, 40,000 people show up and the DC army is like, oh my God, we gotta do something. Because back then DC was a swamp. Mm -hmm. the slaves remove the water, it's a swamp. And so these people are arriving infirmed. And now they got to call in the two only black doctors in the city. And this is how mm -hmm. Howard University Hospital was created. I'm like, what? Really? That's, I didn't know that. Then I learned that Sojourner Truth was a nurse. She came to help. I'm like, I didn't know that. And then of course, Frederick Douglass is friends with Lincoln. So now you have all of these historical figures kind of converging on one story. And I thought that was really, really interesting because I mm. never thought about how each of those people work together in collaboration to make history, so to speak. I was like, oh yeah, I'm applying for this. I'm winning this, okay? And so lo and behold, you know, I did my homework because I, I write for a living as well. I mean, I do public art, but before I did public art, I was a public relations specialist and a journalist. So I start researching and I'm delving. I'm like, this is a really good story. I like this. Now I'm looking at the budget. I'm like, mm. not a lot of money, but you know, I could do something with the bar relief sculpture. And I could, that would allow me to really expand the story. So I wrote this lovely proposal and I, and I won. And then later, I always like to ask, so what happened in selection? Because I don't know how I won, because then it tells me how I can win again. And so she said, you slayed them because you went so deep. Nobody else even touched the history. You went so mm. deep. It made sense. It made, per I mean, perfect sense for that location. And the Civil War Memorial was like, yes, this is what we were hoping for. So again, talking about in context, you know, talking about relativity, I'm talking about hiring an artist to create a solution. And so this is kind of what we do. You know, we're given an assignment and because we have imaginations and imagination is king, it's our job to figure out really good ideas, really good solutions, really, depending on what the goals are, to try to meet the needs for the call. Mm. And depending on a lot of things, depending on how deep you are, depending on how educated you are, depending on how conscious you are, depending on how mindful and caring you are, all these things matter if you're coming with an A game. Mm. Because if you're not coming with an A game, you're not gonna win. Mm. Because public art is generally a competition. 
Sometimes if you're lucky, somebody will come to you and give you a commission, but nine times out of 10, you have to compete. You have yeah. to, which means you have to be good, good relative to the other people you're competing against. So it requires you to have a tremendous depth and understanding of, of human nature, um, of, of culture, uh, sometimes religion, uh, you know, to be able to give a sense of space. It doesn't matter what kind of artwork you're doing. You have to understand how this artwork is going to function and transform a space. And the whole purpose, like you said earlier, is for community dialogue. You want to foster dialogue. You want people to come to this place and talk. You're creating a destination. And so ultimately, intuitively, the big question is, how do you do that? That's our job, to figure mm -hmm. out how to do that. So no matter what the call is, no matter what the subject matter is, no matter where it is, that's the bottom line. You know, usually when somebody comes to me, I'm like, I, I need a site plan. And then I need to come and literally walk the space. I need to feel this place. I need to see what is it and how do people experience it? You know, when they walk up on the artwork, how are they, all these things matter. And again, I know this intuitively, but somebody else might totally sleep that, you know? Yeah. Example, there's a sculpture in Harlem. Was it the Harriet Tubman one over there on, on uh, St. Nick? There's an argument about whether it should be facing north or south. The artist faced it going south. There are people in the community that swear it should be facing the other way. When I saw it, I said, I think the artist placed it aesthetically. But there are other people who disagree. It's all relative. Mm -hmm. you know. And again, the question is, how do you come to a consensus and this is why you have to have dialogue because there's a saying, um, those who complain about how the ball bounces are usually the ones who drop the ball. If you didn't come to the community meeting, if you're not involved with your community, if you're not involved in the dialogue, you don't get to say anything. Show up, talk, give your feedback because later nobody wants to listen to your complaining about what's wrong with something when you weren't there, when there was an opportunity to really have some say, to really have some impact on how things can be. And if you live in a community that's like that, where you have community dialogue, then you should take the time to go to the meetings. You know, if you see an announcement for a charrette or for a community forum, you should show up. They're always very interesting and you get a chance to voice your opinion. Fantastic. I really appreciate that, Vinny, um, diving into that question and really your thoughts or as an experience really as an artist um, working in the world of, of public art. Um, I just want to be conscious of time. We have a few more minutes left. Um, I want to sort of end sort of like uh, sort of some quick thoughts from each of you. Um, this has definitely been a very trying time these past, you know, year or 11 months. Um, and, you know, thinking about the future, what are, what are some of your hopes for where the public art field can go or will go or may go um, in the future? Where, where's, what is, what is, what does that kind of look like for you? If you could, if you could imagine big, um, can I give you a moment, a moment to think about that? Oh, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> Go ahead, Vinny, and then we'll do uh, uh, Kendall and, and Patty uh, about a minute each, and then, yeah. I'm very excited about it. Um, I think um, because of the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor this year, those are like the last straws that have broken uh, the camel's back. Um, I think what was, what is most phenomenal about that and Black Lives Matter is that the whole world is freaking out. It's like, everybody's mm -hmm. mad, everybody's tired, everybody's over it, everybody's protesting. I mean, not just for a day or two, I mean, like for weeks and months and and and, and every time you turn on, somebody's having a fit about something. Um, what I'm hoping for is that the whole human race really gets a grip and starts to evolve um, more towards being humane. Mm. Um, we are still so barbaric, it's just absolutely unreasonable. You know, with this last election, we learned a lot about the tenor of the uh, time and how people are in this country, and it's a little disconcerting, but I think that education is going to be the big deal, that, you know, there are a lot of people who are 
genuinely just misinformed. They just, they just don't know. And so I think that um, that's a large part that public art can play. It's easy to make an artwork in a public place and educate somebody in really 10 minutes rather than trying to figure out how to create a curriculum mm -hmm. or trying to figure out how to fund a movie you know, that costs a whole lot more. Um, I think public art uh, has such potential for making an impact on uh, uplifting the human race. Um, the other uh, aspect of it is, and you know, and these days, it, it, the press calls regularly and asks me my opinion. Um, they want to know, you know, what about women and minorities in the public art arena? And I'm like, that's going to be slow um, because of the way that the public art arena is set up. Um, it is it is difficult for a neophyte to get into this arena because. Uh, you, first of all, you're talking about large budgets and you really kind of need to be experienced. So the question is, who's going to support those people? You know, if you, let's just say you're really, really talented and there are a lot of really talented people out there. I mean, there's a gajillion of them, but if you're really, really talented and you don't have experience in public art, but you're interested in it. And let's just say a, uh, a commissioner is interested in you. It's like, how do you provide support for those people to invite them into the arena? Because this is a chicken and egg type arena. If you don't have one, you can't get one. Exactly, yeah. You know, I see that, Vinny, yeah. I wanna give Patty and Kendall a, a minute uh, because we're, we're almost out of time, so. But thank you, Vinny, I really appreciate that, particularly as your perspective as an artist um, who's been in this arena for quite some time. Uh, Kendall, do you wanna? Yeah. And, and, you know, being uh, an advocate of what the power of public art, what I hope is for more voices to be heard, more uh, diversity within who is being commissioned and who is commissioning, and not just with the permanent stuff like what Vinny may be talking about, but giving room for temporary and ephemeral and, you know, a whole variety mm -hmm. of these kinds of things. So that, that's what I hope for. Uh, coming from artists themselves and from the, the, the people who give artists the opportunities to make it more open. Fantastic. Thank you, Kendall. Patty, want to wrap us up? Yeah, wrap it up. I agree with uh, with both of with what you said, and I think yes, I think in a moment where we're so bombarded also by the media and by mm -hmm. you know so much negativity. I feel like I I look to the arts and the the public art to kind of inform our opinions and our awareness through visual images um, that could that could be have a more positive effect on us than every than all the noise that's surrounding us constantly. So. I'm hoping that you know we can turn to art more and more to be more informed and to be more tolerant um, as opposed to relying on so much other negative you know imagery. And I also want to add that I, I think that going through the whole pandemic, I think we have a new appreciation for outdoor spaces. Um, and so I think that that's you know looking to the future of cities also I think is a new, appreciation for what we can do within the public space, um, you know, and, and being outside in our own cities and making spaces that are that are beautiful and that are welcoming and that you, we can, that neighborhoods and communities can appreciate as well, so. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Patty and Kendall and Vinny. Um, this has really been an exciting um, hour that we really had together um, and I hope everyone out there enjoyed it. Um, I thank you all for all the work you do. Um, thank you for everybody that's out there who's listening and all the work that you do. I'm just going to turn it over to Christina to wrap us up. And thank you again, everybody, for your participation and for listening to us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you again to all of our panelists and, and Patricia for leading us through this conversation. Um, as we mentioned earlier, this, this conversation was recorded and will be uploaded to the Americans for the Arts YouTube channel um, shortly, and you should receive a, a follow-up email about that. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Good night. <laughs>